Live from Boston, my name is Emilio Madrigal, and today is January 29, 2022. I am remotely joined by my good friend and colleague, Rafat Manan, and this is going to be the second session of the Pancreatobiliary Pathology Society short course that we're running this weekend on PathCast. Um, this session is Neuroendocrine Neoplasms of the Pancreas and Differential Diagnosis, and it's going to be a first a didactic lecture followed by a slide seminar, and this is going to be by Dr. Stefano La Rosa and Dr. Silvia Uccella. Um, as always, please feel free to post questions and comments in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we will pass those along. So with that, I will now turn the microphone over to both Dr. Stefano La Rosa and Dr. Silvia Uccella. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank uh, the Educational Committee for inviting us uh, to give uh, this talk uh, on neuroendocrine neoplasm of the pancreas, and the outline of this presentation will be shown to you by Professor Uccella. Good morning also from my side. This presentation will be divided in two parts. In the first part, I will give you the definition of the neuroendocrine neoplasm, and I will propose pancreatic NEMS as the prototype for NEMS classification. In the second more specific part, Professor La Rosa will go through epidemiology, specific types, prognostic criteria, familial context, and mimickers of uh, pan nems. So now we can go through the first uh, part. So the definition of neuroendocrine neoplasm can be given as the proliferation of neoplastic cells that show functional, morphological, and immunophenotypical features reminiscent of neuroendocrine cells. Neuroendocrine cells are a major component of the endocrine system, which is composed by organs and structures that have different morphological and functional aspects. So we have serogenic cells, follicular thyroid cells, and neuroendocrine cells, which can be divided into epithelial and non-epithelial. Um, the diffuse neuroendocrine system is the integral part of the neuroendocrine cells as the islets of Langerhans, parathyroids, and anterior pituitary. The non-epithelial neuroendocrine cells are found in the adrenal medulla and paraganglia. So, what are the features of neuroendocrine cells? Functionally, they uh, are able to secrete mediators, which are hormones, but which are also, when produced by neurons, neurotransmitters. So we have the same mediators in the neurons and in the neuroendocrine cells from which uh, the name neuro. This function is mirrored by the morphological features of neuroendocrine cells. At the optical microscope, we see the neuroendocrine features in normal neuroendocrine cells, which are given by a moderately abundant uh, eosinophilic and granular cytoplasm. Nuclear features are that of uh, um, active uh, protein uh, produ um, producing cells, and uh, most important, the ultrastructural features of the neuroendocrine cells are the witness of the neuroendocrine function. We find the uh, secretory granules and synaptic vesicles, just like uh, as in the neurons. And finally, the immunophenotypical features are sustained by the expression of general neuroendocrine markers. General neuroendocrine markers may be divided into several groups. However, the, it is important to state that the most accurate neuroendocrine markers are chromogranin A, synaptophysin, and INSM1, the novel marker the insulinoma associated protein 1, which are the most sensitive and specific markers to be used in routine diagnostics. By contrast, enolase, neuron-specific enolase PGP 9.5 and CD56 are to be used with caution and if 
possible not to be used at all because they are non-specific. In the context of pancreatic NEMS, in specific clinical context, uh, hormone immunohistochemistry may be of use for the definition of a specific type of pan NEMS. The classification of pancreatic NEMS may be used as the prototype for all NEMS classification. We all know by now that among NEMS there is a very important heterogeneity and that they may be divided into at least two big families, neuron rocking tumors and neuron rocking carcinomas. But what are the differences between these two families? In fact, very different neoplasms, as those shown in the figures, may be very intensely positive for new general neuron docking markers. However, they look very, very different. The first one has a well differentiated morphology, this one has a poorly differentiated small cell type morphology, and the last one has a large cell type poorly differentiated morphology. So we know that we have to separate well differentiated NEMS from poorly differentiated ones. In the pancreas, well differentiated NEMS are the majority, the large majority. They have an indolent or moderately aggressive behavior, and they are resistant to platinum based therapy. In contrast, poorly differentiated NEMS, which are a small subset in the pancreas, have a very aggressive clinical behavior and respond, at least initially, to platinum based um, chemotherapeutics. This clinical pathological heterogeneity is also mirrored by the molecular data that have been accumulating in the last few years. We know by now that well-differentiated pan-NEMS are driven by mutation in the MEN1 gene, and they also can show alteration in the mTOR complex in the chromatin remodeling system and the DNA damage repair system. They also express somatostatin receptors. Intermediate and high-grade well-differentiated pan NEMS may also show mutations in DAX and TRX genes. In contrast, purely differentiated neuroendocrine neoplasms in the pancreas are thought to be driven by mutations in the TP53 genes. This is possibly in common with the pathogenesis of the pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The additional mutation in the RB1 gene and BCL2 gene, which increase cell proliferation, are thought to be key alterations in the pathogenesis of poorly differentiated pan NEMS. These two different pathogenetic pathways are useful, have been useful for decision making in the therapeutic management of the patient. In that sunitinib mTOR inhibitors and somatostatin analogs are active against well differentiated pan NEMS whereas platinum-based chemotherapy is active against poorly differentiated pan NEMS. So now we know that pan NEMS are to be distinguished in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, pan NEMS, which are well differentiated NEMS, and pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinomas PAN-NEX, which are poorly differentiated with their large cell and small cell types. Now we have established that morphological differentiation is important. And what about proliferation grading? Where and when it has to be used, and which are the practical issues that can be encountered in the diagnostic routine? 
We will recall that in the WHO classification of 2010 of the digestive system tumors, morphological differentiation and proliferation grading were overlapping, in that neuroendocrine tumors were all G1 or G2, whereas the G3 category was overlapping with neuroendocrine carcinoma, so too with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine neoplasms. Nevertheless, in the next few years, it became evident that G3 NEMs were not an homogeneous category, neither from a clinical nor from a morphological point of view. In fact, it was demonstrated that G3 NEMs not only included poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, but also a subset of well-differentiated NEMs, so NEMs, which did not respond to platinum-based therapy and had a longer survival, as shown in the figures. So, there, there had to be something in between well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas as classified by the WHO 2010. And, in fact, this was the net G3 category. In the WHO 2017, the G3 pan net was introduced for the first time, so it was recognized that high-grade NEMs can be either well differentiated or poorly differentiated. However, in the 2017 classification, PANEX were still graded G3. In the last classification of the digestive tumors, however, the differentiation and proliferation graded have been well separated. So now, by now we know that only NETs are to be graded according to the proliferation index, either ki 67 or mitotic index. In contrast, NEN, NEX, of the large cell or small cell types are high grade by definition and they are not to be graded. So saying that a pan neck is G3 is no longer needed. And this is just a joke from me to you. So, what are the practical issues in diagnostic routine about morphological differentiation and proliferation grade? We have to distinguish net G3 from NEC. We have to establish the proliferation grade from, for NETs. And we have to know the thresholds for proliferation index um, that separate G1 and G2 tumors. In this work by uh, the Memorial uh, uh, Sloan Catering Center group, um, they have provided us with morphological, immunohistochemical and clinical parameters that should be uh, considered when separating G3 nets from uh, neck. So the presence of an associated low-grade net component, the loss of ducts and the ATRX, and the clinical evidence of an indolent or moderately aggressive uh, neuroendocrine neoplasm favors G3 net, whereas neck is favored by the presence of an associated non-neuroendocrine component, the loss at immunohistochemistry of RB expression or of the abnormal expression of P53, and the clinical evidence of a very high-grade aggressive neoplasm. Immunohistochemistry may be of help. We have also seen the value of P53RB somatostatin receptors and DAX at your X. The um, expression pattern of chromogranin A may be of help because it is expressed in a, in a duct like fission in a, a poorly differentiated necks. And 
the KI67 index may be of use, however, uh, no uh, defined upper cutoff for net G3 has been established. So the proposed cutoff of 55% uh, in morphological terms uh, has not a very important uh, value. The proliferation grade is established by counting mitosis and determining ki 67 proliferation index. Mitosis are to be counted per 2 square millimeters by considering at least 50 fields and in this very recent paper appeared on endocrine pathology in this January by Ian Cree, he details how to count mitosis in neuroendocrine neoplasms and he also stresses the value of phosphoestone H3 for counting mitosis. As for the ki 67 proliferation index, it has to be counted in the hotspot area. At least 500 cells have to be counted. Every positivity, regardless its intensity, is to be confirmed. And it is advisable in NETS to count um, ki 67 proliferation index also on metastatic sites because an increase in, in grade may be observed. Uh, perhaps the best um, way to count um, ki 67 positive cells is to print the microscopic images, but it is possible that in the future automatic uh, uh, counters may be uh, optimized also for uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms. There is uh, um, an active debate about the thresholds that separate GI versus G2 nets. Uh, in the WHO classification, 3% uh, for ki 67 proliferation index has been maintained at, as uh, the valid threshold. However, there are many papers that propose other thresholds, and in some papers, the 5% seems to be a better cutoff for separating um, low-grade from intermediate-grade nets. However, maybe it is advisable for each case to report the actual proliferation index so that uh, the oncologist may use them as a uh, continuous variable and they may optimize the therapeutic uh, uh, management of the patient case by case by tailoring the management. And in the end, two words about uh, minims, because uh, NET and NEX are not the only families of pan-NEMS, there is further heterogeneity in that a uh, non-neuroendocrine component may be present. This happens associated um, in most cases with NEX and this configures the category of minin. The term minin has been introduced for the first time in 2016, and in 2017 it has been accepted by the WHO classification of endocrine tumors. It is a mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine neoplasm in which two morphologically distinguishable and immunohistochemically confirmed components are present, one neuroendocrine and the other non-neuroendocrine. An arbitrary cutoff of 30% for each component has been introduced in the digestive system. However, there is debate on the validity of this uh, cutoff in that uh, uh, also, a small component of purely differentiated uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas has to be, in our opinion, reported in the pathological report because it can be clinically relevant. Um, Minen has uh, replaced the term MANEC because it is by now evident that uh, spectrum of 
possible combination do exist both in the pancreas and out of the pancreas. In the pancreas we have, for example, uh, the combination of ductal adenocarcinoma and neck or acinal carcinoma and neck. However, we have to remember that menin is not a diagnosis. Menin is a concept. When we see a menin, we have to identify the two components. We have to type and classify each component by grading them when necessary. And we have also to quantify the two components. This allows a prognostic classification of this entity and this entity may be applied in every part of the body where neuroendocrine neoplasms arise. Minans may go in differential diagnosis with other entities. However, if we keep well in mind that morphology first should be considered for diagnosis a minan, so we have to see with our eyes at the microscope the two different components, one with a morphological neuroendocrine aspect and one with a morphological non-neuroendocrine aspect, and we use properly the general neuroendocrine markers, we will not have problems in classify and diagnose means. And to conclude the first part, we um, have proposed a pan NANS as the prototype from, for NANS classification and in fact in 2018 a common classification framework from new, for neuroendocrine neoplasm has been proposed and the outline is exactly that that we have seen in the pancreas so NETS, NEX and MINANS. And, uh, now I leave the stage to Professor La Rosa. Silvia, thank you. And now we move to the second part of, the, of this presentation. And in the second part, uh, we will discuss uh, in detail, uh, in more in more specific way, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasm. Uh, in these slides, uh, you, can, uh, you can see some uh, epidemiological data and uh, Pancreatic uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor represent uh, about uh, two five percent uh, of all pancreatic tumors, and the HANA incidence is uh, less than one case uh, for uh, 100,000 people. However, in uh, autopsy studies, uh, the incidence uh, of uh, this uh, tumor uh, is high uh, when uh, uh, pancreatic tissue was examined uh, in uh, in an extensive way. Um, it's worth noting that uh, uh, the incidence of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma, like uh, other neuroendocrine neoplasma of the body, increased in incidence in the last uh, year. And in this paper, uh, very recent paper, you can see that the um, incidence of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma is not the same around the world. and. Uh, for example, in, in uh, India, China, and uh, Portugal, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma represent the, the first neuroendocrine uh, tumor type. Uh, conversely, in, in the United States and in most of uh, European uh, uh, countries, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma are not the most uh, prevalent uh, tumor type. In uh, this uh, paper, uh, I I um, uh, wrote, uh, I published uh, uh, with a uh, Swiss uh, uh, team uh, last year. You can see that uh, um, uh, the, the, the incidence, incidence and prevalence of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma has increased uh, like other neuroendocrine tumor type of the digestive system in the last 40 years. And uh, in, the, in, in this paper, we collected data from two uh, registries of the Canton Vaux and Canton de Neuchâtel, and uh, you can see that uh, gastric uh, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma represent about 12% uh, of tumors, uh, and uh, uh, the incidence of uh, the prevalence of uh, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinomas is higher. 
In, in this uh, study, we uh, review all the diagnosis uh, and uh, we were able to separate uh, NETG3 from NEX because uh, we uh, review all the uh, pathological reports. Um, in the pancreas, uh, we have different uh, types of NEN uh, that uh, on the basis of clinical presentation we can separate it in non-functioning and functioning and on morphological ground as discussed in uh, my previous part of this presentation in uh, NET and NEX. Uh, I don't have the time uh, to discuss in detail of all different uh, <coughs> types of, of pancreatic neurodeficiency neoplas and uh, I, uh, I thought to uh, discuss with you uh, new uh, insights of insulinoma because the other tumor types are more or less the same in terms of morphology, molecular profile, and the immunistic chemical profiles. So there are some news in insulinomas that I would like to present to you now. Insulinoma is the most uh, frequent uh, uh, function in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, representing about 40% uh, of all pancreatic uh, function in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, and uh, about uh, 4 to 20% of uh, resected pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The incidence uh, uh, is from 0 0.07 to 0 0.4, depending on uh, the, the, the study. But uh, it's uh, important to underline that uh, in the most of cases, uh, insulinomas are indolent tumors with an excellent prognosis, uh, in general grade 1 tumors, and these tumors are very, very rarely metastatic. However, exists a, a, a subgroup of pancreatic insulinomas, uh, representing about 10% of cases, which show an aggressive biological behavior. This tumor can be metastatic at the time of diagnosis, or sometimes metastasis can develop during the follow-up, and the survival of this tumor is much more uh, poor than the other tumor type. Indolent uh, insulinomas associated with an excellent prognosis in general are small tumors and in fact in most of cases they can be enucleated with a minor uh, surgical, pancreatic surgery. <coughs> and morphologically uh, these tumors uh, are composed of well differentiated cells showing a trabecular or pseudo-acinar structure frequently with uh, an abundant uh, uh, stroma, and in some cases uh, the stroma is uh, uh, characterized by an amyloid deposition, amyloid deposition uh, which depends on the production of a specific peptide, uh, uh, the name is a Heislet amyloid polypeptide or hamilin, and uh, this uh, peptide is uh, produced by uh, beta cells uh, together with insulin and released with the insulin. When uh, uh, hamilin is uh, produced uh, and uh, uh, the secretion uh, is uh, very, very high, there is uh, a deposition of this peptide before in, in, the, in the cytoplasm of cell and then outside the cells, forming amyloid deposits. And if you use antibodies directed against the isolate amyloid polypeptide, you can see that there is a positivity inside the cytoplasm of tumor cell, but also in the amyloid deposits, uh, which represent the most important extracellular uh, component of um, uh, these insulinomas. Obviously, these tumors are positive for insulin, pro-insulin, and are positive for PDX1. In most of cases, uh, indolent insulinomas are G1 with uh, a K67 proliferating index low, uh, lower than uh, um, 3%. <coughs> uh, from a molecular point of view, um, indolent insulinoma can show mutation in MEN1 gene, although when sporadic, and uh, recently, a, a mutation in uh, the YY1 gene has been identified in about 30% of uh, sporadic insulinomas, and uh, uh, this uh, mutation is considered like uh, a, a specific drive mutation of this uh, tumor type. 
As I told you before, about 10% of insulinomas are more aggressive and these tumor types can present metastasis at the time of diagnosis. In most of cases, metastasis are in the liver. You can see here in a case with the resection of liver metastasis and here a lobectomy, a hepatic lobectomy with multiple metastasis. And this tumor, and this tumor in particular uh, is characterized by a trabecular uh, structure of well-differentiated cell showing a, uh, some histological feature of aggressiveness like for example as you can see here a perineural invasion. These tumors are positive for insulin sometimes uh, in a reduced the percentage of tumor cell and in most of the cases these tumors are G2 and uh, as you can see in this picture this particular case is, uh, was a G3 with a K67 label index higher than 20%. Interestingly uh, this uh, type of insulinoma and uh, so yeah aggressive uh, insulinoma show immunoreactivity for uh, this uh, transcription factor ARX uh, which uh, is uh, a transcription factor involved in uh, alpha cell fate uh, during embryogenesis. So to summarize there are some specific uh, clinical pathological features of these aggressive uh, insulinomas. The first one is that these tumors are uh, larger than indolent insulinoma in general I'm measuring more than two centimeters and uh, uh, in several cases more than three centimeters. In most of cases these tumors are G2, uh, G1 uh, uh, insulinomas in these uh, specific subtypes are rare and in some cases are G3 like the case I showed you before. These aggressive uh, insulinomas can be positive for PDX1 but in less uh, percentage of cases uh, in comparison with indolent insulinoma and a characteristic immunohistochemical profile is the expression of ARX and the stroke expression of this uh, transcription factor is associated with a very aggressive um, behavior. In addition, in uh, this uh, particular uh, insulinoma subtype, if we also have a loss of ATRX or DAX and uh, an alpha phenotype, we have an additional increase of risk of metastasis. In this uh, very nice paper published uh, uh, two years ago, one year ago, in reality, in reality you can see that uh, indolent insulinoma in which we don't have any alteration of aortic X, uh, we have an excellent prognosis uh, and uh, in a tumor showing this uh, alpha-like phenotype uh, you can see an, a more aggressive behavior and uh, in, in this paper the authors suggested that uh, we have two different uh, molecular pathway one involving uh, YUI1 gene for indolent insulinomas and the other one involving ATRX DAX alt phenotype and ARX mutation in more aggressive insulinomas. Now we move to uh, prognostic criteria of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, as uh, before uh, uh, well uh, uh, discussed, uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas are very aggressive tumor and represent a different entity uh, in comparison with uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, we have uh, some uh, prognostic criteria. The first one is uh, uh, the clinical presentation in this paper uh, published uh, about uh, 10 years ago but involving very large series of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor you can see that uh, in most of cases insulinoma show a very uh, good prognosis and uh, this group is represented mainly by indolent insulinoma and you can see anyway that there is not 100% of survival and these cases, these minority cases represented by aggressive insulinomas, but anyway insulinomas are distinct from 
uh, other functional type of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and non-functioning tumors that uh, are together. Another uh, very important prognostic factor is uh, stage. Uh, in this very recent paper, a uh, European multi-institutional study uh, collecting very large series of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasma, you can see that the stage is associated with uh, overall survival and uh, disease-free survival. And also grade is associated with uh, uh, different uh, prognosis. And in uh, this study, we uh, were able also to separate the G3 uh, neuroendocrine tumor from NEX. And uh, you can see that there is a separation between NETG1 and NETG2, NETG3, and also a separation with pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinoma. So uh, stage and grade represent a very important uh, uh, prognostic factors. There are additional factors like vascular invasion, perineural invasion that have been suggested in the last year and uh, they, they are more often associated with uh, um, aggressiveness but uh, in a multivariate analysis uh, key 67 so grade and uh, stage are independent prognostic factors. A paper uh, published some years ago uh, suggesting cytokeratine 19 expression as a prognostic factor in reality has not been confirmed in other, in other study, study. So I think that uh, cytokeratine 19 immunohistochemistry is not useful to identify more aggressive neoplasm. <clears throat> In most of cases, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are sporadic, but uh, there is a list of uh, hereditary or familial syndromes in, uh, in which uh, we can find a neuroendocrine tumor as part of the clinical context. MEN1, von Ippelin down, neurofibromatosis, and other, other, tumor, other uh, syndrome types. Um, I don't uh, uh, discuss uh, these uh, different uh, uh, syndromes because I don't have the time, but I would like uh, to uh, show you some important point that the pathologist uh, can consider uh, because in some cases uh, uh, the pancreatic tumor may represent uh, the first manifestation of the disease and also uh, in this case we can suggest uh, the possibility of uh, endocrine syndrome. Most of uh, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, associated with endocrine syndrome, MEM1, bolimpelin down, etc., are in general multifocal. So there is, uh, in, the, in this uh, particular familial context, uh, a multifocality of tumor, while in sporadic tumor, in general, we, don't, we only have a solitary tumor. In some uh, particular uh, condition, like the Bonipolindau disease, uh, we I may I, I have association with other um, pancreatic lesion like uh, uh, serocyst adenoma. In, uh, uh, frequently in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, disease, uh, we can have a precursor lesion like uh, islet dysplasia, nesidioblastosis, peliosis of non-tumor islets. And also, immune histochemistry in the suspect of a, a genetic background can be useful because, for example, in MEN1 syndrome, we have the lack of menin expression. In the MEN4, the P27 expression is lack. In a patient with von Ippelin dau disease, a neuroendocrine neoplasma can show alpha inhibin expression. And in particular, uh, disease like uh, Mavash disease or familial insulinomatosis, we have the expression of one hormone in all the different uh, tumors, and in particular in the Mavash disease, we have a glucagon immunoreactivity in all uh, different tumors, and in familial insulinomatosis, the insulin. This is an example of a, a multifocal neuroendocrine tumor. We have a nodule here and three other here. And uh, this is an, an example of a glucagon cell hyperplasia and the neoplasia, the Mavash disease. And you can see several different uh, microtumors that uh, are confirmed in uh, histological section. And uh, all these tumors are positive 
for glucose. Immunohistochemistry can be useful in uh, selected cases, and you can see, for example, here a MEN1 patient in which uh, the tumor is negative for menin expression. In the MALAS disease, uh, we have a glucagon expression in all uh, different uh, tumor types and the uh, dysplastic islet. And in familial insulomatosis, insulin is only the only markers expressed. The last uh, topic of this uh, presentation uh, is the differential diagnosis, uh, and which include uh, mainly uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm and acinal cell carcinoma. Uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm in most of cases show a cystic appearance, but there are some cases in which uh, the, the, the macroscopic features are uh, solid. And uh, in uh, these cases, uh, uh, the differential diagnosis uh, with the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor can be problematic because these tumors are composed of uniform polygonal cells and growing in solid fashion or sometimes showing a pseudopapillary structure. And immunohistochemistry is useful for the variant diagnosis, but we, we need to consider that these tumors are positive for insulin, so insulin alone cannot be used for the differential diagnosis between um, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. In general, uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm also shows beta catenin expression, cycline cyclin D1 expression, Re progesterone receptor is positive, but don't uh, uh, forget that also pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor can be positive. Ecaderin is lost in a solid pseudopapillary tumor when using uh, antibodies directly against the, the extracellular portion or nuclear when the, the intracellular one. And the most important, I think, um, marker is the CD99, which shows a particular dot-like paranuclear immunoactivity in solid pseudopapillary news, uh, news. So, to summarize, uh, I think that uh, synaptophysin is not uh, useful for the different diagnosis. We can use a chromogranin A, which is positive in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, a CD99 with a, this dot-like uh, positivity in uh, a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. In addition, we can use uh, eventually a, 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 a cadarin, beta catenin for to complete the panel. Uh, Asina cell carcinoma in general is a large tumor uh, showing a densely cellulated uh, proliferation associated with necrosis. In uh, the typical uh, presentation, uh, the morphology is uh, easy uh, and uh, it permits to identify asinal cell carcinoma, but sometimes uh, asinal cell carcinoma can show a trabecular uh, architecture, and so in these cases it may be difficult to uh, differentiate it from uh, um, neuroendocrine tumor. We can look at uh, nuclei, in general, there are very, very prominent nucleol, uh, nucleol, and uh, this is a very useful morphological feature for the distinction. Um, arsenal cell carcinoma are positive for arsenal cell markers, uh, and I think that uh, the use of trypsin, BCL10, and chemotrypsin uh, is a uh, uh, able to identify 100% of acinal cell carcinoma, acinal cell carcinoma that can be positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin in about 30% of cases. So the use of uh, neuronicrine markers alone uh, is, uh, is dangerous be because uh, we can miss the diagnosis of acinal cell carcinoma. And, uh, Anyway, when we have a suspect of a, an acinal cell carcinoma or a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, we, we, uh, and we have the problem of different diagnosis, we all we, uh, need to use both neuroendocrine and acinal cell marker. I can show you this example of a solid tumor uh, showing a well-differentiated morphology and at immunohistochemistry, this tumor is positive for chromogranin and trypsin. So, if in this particular case you use only chromogranin immunohistochemistry, you can uh, see a diagnosis of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. But this tumor is a mixed acinal carcinoma because it shows also a trypsin immunoactivity and BCL10 uh, positivity. So to summarize, when you have a tumor with a neuroendocrine 
like uh, morphology, but we have uh, an unexpected abundant necrosis, prominent nucleoli, and, and an unexpected high mycotic count, a high K67 index, you have to think to a mixed acinal cell carcinoma or a pure acinal cell carcinoma, and so you have to use also acinal cell uh, markers uh, in the immunohistochemical panel that you can use. So we thank uh, so much all of you for your attention. And we wait for your questions, see if you have one. Welcome to the slice seminar. Uh, we will present uh, four cases, and uh, the first case and the second case will be presented by Professor Uccella. Good morning again. The first case is the case of a man, 49 years old, who presented with severe pain in the left leg with no other symptom. He had no trauma history and no significant comorbidities. He underwent a full body CT scan that revealed a 3 cm lesion in the pancreatic tail. He underwent pancreatectomy and splenectomy. And we received the slides for consultation from uh, another institution. This is the slide. And at low power, we can see a proliferation of gland-like structures uh, embedded in a very um, in a very sclerotic stroma at higher man magnification perineural invasion is evident and the glandular architecture architecture is sometimes replaced by a trabecular growth and in some fields by a solid solidness growth accompanied by a cribriform pattern in some, in some uh, fields. The fibrous trauma is very evident. No necrosis was found. At higher magnification, the cells are uniform with moderately abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. The nuclear the nuclei are round with finely dispersed chromatin and small nucleoli. Metatic figures are very rare, just two for two square millimeters, and uh, peripancreatic lymph nodes are positive for metastasis. We had four positive lymph nodes out of 18 isolated lymph nodes. Immunohistochemistry was performed based on the particular morphology of the neoplastic cells and neuroendocrine markers were positive, uh, chromogranin A, synaptophysin, as well as uh, in uh, ENSM1. Acinar cell markers were negative, both trypsin and BCL10 were performed and all pancreatic hormones were uh, performed with only somatostatin positive with an intense immunostain in 100% of cells. Proliferation index, surprisingly, was very high. It was about 40%. Other immunostains uh, such as carcinomembranic antigen, CEA 19.9, CEA 1 to 5 were negative, as well as MAD4 were performed and it was positive, it was present. So what is your diagnosis? We have a glandular or prevalently glandular proliferation. We have cells which are not very atypical, with few mitosis and uh, with uh, neuroendocrine morphology and the presence of neuroendocrine markers. So this is an N or an unN. We think that this is an N both for morphology and for immunohistochemistry. This is a PANET 
or the panic. We have a key I67 proliferation index of 40%, which is high grade for sure. But this is a G3 PANNET or PANNEC. How to distinguish G3 PANNET from NEC? We have seen the, that in the lecture uh, before. There is not a definite cutoff for KI67, and this is well established. But in this case, P53 was expressed in scattered cells with a wild type pattern. RB was present, so it was not lost. ATRX was present. And somatocytin receptor was not expressed with the, um, internal, an internal control, so we can be sure of our immunostain. Why somatostatin receptor may be not expressed in a neoplasm that otherwise looks like, very like a net, so a well-differentiated pancreatic NEM? This is because some, it has been demonstrated that somatostatin um, positive tumors may not express uh, the somatostatin receptor 2A, but rather express somatostatin receptor 5. So it can be the reason for the negativity of uh, um, the somatostatin receptor. So what is your diagnosis? Is this a G3 net or is this a, a large cell neck? Morphology stays for a net, for the nuclei, for the um, cytoplasms, for the small nucleoli, and also immunohistochemistry with wild type P53 expression and uh, maintenance of uh, RB expression stays for a G3 net. But what type of net is this? You have seen with the Professor La Rosa that specific types of pan nets are multiple. We have non-functioning and a number of functioning pan nets, among which somatostatinoma is a, a, a possible type, also if somatostatinoma is possibly more frequent in the duodenum. Anyway, was this uh, somatostatin producing cell tumor functioning or non-functioning? We know from the clinical records that there were uh, no signs of uh, um, somatostatin hypersecretion. So there was no diarrhea, diabetes, gallstones or hypochloridria. So this was clinical, clinically silent, and we can say that this is a non-functioning somatostatin producing this cell tumor of the pancreas. And that's it. Pancreatic somatostatin producing tumors are uh, morphologically very similar to other pan nets. Uh, they um, prevalently grow in solid nests and uh, trabecular structures. Um, rarely they can grow in glandular or pseudoglandular structures as uh, just like duodenal somatostatin producing these cell tumors and this was one case and this has been described also uh, from uh, our group. What was the follow-up of the patient? Six months after surgery, he had liver metastasis. He started chemotherapy, but unfortunately, he died of disease three years after diagnosis. So what are the comments about this case? Nodal glands in the pancreas are adenocarcinoma. We have to look very, very uh, specifically at the morphology at the cellular level, and also we have to suspect that uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms may uh, ha also have pseudoglandular pattern. Uh, not all nets are low intermediate grade, and this we have discussed in uh, our lecture before. So this was a G3 non-functioning pan net. 
and not all somatostatin producing nets in the pancreas are somatostatinoma. This cell, this cell somatostatin uh, producing uh, pan nets are an option. And that's all for this case. So let's go to case two. This is the case of a 34 year old male which presented with burning upper abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. His clinical history was mute for any gastrointestinal disease, but 17 years earlier, so at the age of 17, he uh, underwent transesphenoidal surgery for um, pituitary uh, adenoma for a prolactin secreting uh, pituitary adenoma. He underwent upper digestive endoscopy and gastric biopsies. This is the uh, slide with the gastric biopsy. You can see that he had a hyperplastic mucosa in his gastric uh, fundus. And we observed uh, um, a nodular growth of uh, very bland cells with moderately abundant eosinophilic and granular cytoplasm. The nuclei were very uniform with dispersed chromatin. It is, had a well differentiated neuroendocrine morphology uh, that was confirmed by general neuroendocrine markers. This is chromogranin A, and chromogranin A showed also an uh, um, hyperplasy of the uh, neuroendocrine cells of the gastric fundus. Ki I67 was less than 1% when performed on the neoplastic cells. So we had a neuro a G1 gastric net. You know that net, gastric nets may be classified in three types according to the clinical setting in which they arise and to the um, alteration of the surrounding mucosa. So we have type 1 associated with chronic atrophic gastritis, type 2 associated with Zollingerellism disease, and type 3 with no specific clinical association. This case uh, was possibly a type 2 because there was no gastric um, atrophic mucosa around the nodule. The nodule was very small, so we did not, did not have reasons to suspect a type 3 net. And the clinical um, setting of the patient was that of uh, uh, burning uh, pain in the epigastrium and uh, the surrounding mucosa uh, around the nodule was very hyperplastic also in absence of a real ulcer in the um, in the stomach and it was not found so the patient underwent an uh, abdominal uh, CT scan contrast enhanced that showed two hyperenhancing nodules in the pancreatic head and body, and a duodenal wall thickening with surrounding fat stranding. We received a duodenopancreatectomy specimen that is showed in uh, this image. This is the duodenal wall opened, and you can, you can see here a nodule that infiltrates the duodenal wall from the mucosa through all the um, through all the, uh, the duodenal wall uh, up to the uh, the serosa. Um, these are the uh, histological uh, images. Here is the duodenal mucosa, and here is the proliferation of uh, neoplastic cells arranged in cords and uh, small nests with a well differentiated neuroendocrine morphology, chromogranin A and gastrin were positive. So the diagnosis was that of a duodenal a net, a duodenal functioning uh, gastrinoma. In the pancreas, we saw 
the nodules, one in the head and one in the body, and uh, mm, this is a, a lymph node with a, a focal metastasis. These are the mm, histological images of the pancreatic nodules. We had multiple non-functioning panets. Um, moreover, in the surrounding uh, in the surrounding pancreatic uh, uh, parenchyma, we saw many uh, small uh, non-functioning uh, nets. So, at this stage, our patient had a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor productin secreting at the age of 17, a duodenal gastrinoma, two pancreatic nets, and many pancreatic micronets. According to the guidelines, we have, are in the position of having the clinical suspect of a MEN1 syndrome. The clinical suspect should be always confirmed by a genetic analysis, so the patient should have been um, sent to um, a genetic, uh, an oncologic uh, genetic counseling and uh, uh, a molecular analysis for the uh, mutations of MAN1 gene should have been uh, performed. This is very important because also in presence of multiple uh, neuroendocrine tumors, you can have something that is called phenocopies. So the phenocopies is a clinical setting that mimics the one of a genetic syndrome, but it is not sustained by a germinal mutation. This is very important both for the patients and for uh, the, their relatives, as you can imagine. This patient in his follow-up had at 38 years a parathyroid adenoma. At 44 years, he underwent, uh, underwent uh, upper right, uh, upper left lobectomy with two nodules. One was a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and the other was a typical, um, a typical carcinoid. So the spectrum of his syndrome was very wide. Moreover, during his follow-up, this patient at uh, the age of 44 had uh, another uh, gastric uh, endoscopy with gastric biopsies, and we found uh, another gastric net, another small G1 gastric net. Now, gastric nets are very, very rarely part of the MEN1 syndrome. However, maybe they are linked to the presence of zellinger ellison syndrome more than to MEN1 syndrome per se. We can speculate about which kind of gastric net this could be, because if we go back to our classification of gastric nets, this is not a type 1 because there was no gastric atrophy, this is not a type 2 because the zellinger ellison disease was resolved uh, with the duodenopancreatectomy. And this is not a type 3 because it is very small, it is very indolent. We have no reason to think that this could be a type 3. Now, one possibility is that, uh, that this is a part of the mon syndrome, as we uh, recalled. However, we should acknowledge that other types of pan net have been described. There is a type for uh, linked with achloridria, uh, parietal cell hyperplasia, and multiple gastric carcinoids, and a type 5, which is linked to the use, the continuous use of uh, um, protonic pump inhibitors. This patient, uh, in fact, um, had a prolonged use of uh, protonic pump inhibitors due to uh, the duodenopancreatectomy that uh, included also uh, a gastric entrum. So maybe this could be, uh, be better classified as a type 5 gastric net. So 
The comments for this case are that when one can be suspected on clinical pathological basis but must be confirmed with genetic analysis. In this patient, the spectrum was very wide. And um, in reality, in men one patients, not all nets are necessarily men one related. In this patient, we had a gastric net that possibly was related to another uh, condition. Now we move to case uh, number three. This is a, a 59-year-old man uh, presented with a renal colic and uh, during imaging a 10-centimeter sized pancreatic nodule uh, in the, was identified uh, at uh, uh, ultrasonography and for uh, this reason a cytocytology was uh, performed and uh, this uh, cytology uh, specimen was uh, uh, suggestive for neuroendocrine tumor. So, the patient moved in our hospital for surgery and distal pancreatectomy was performed. And uh, 17 years later, uh, the resection uh, patient uh, who was uh, well without any symptoms uh, developed liver metastasis. This is the macroscopy of uh, the tumor resected. Uh, you can see there is a well delimited nodule. And interestingly, the surface of uh, the, the lesion shows the re some areas um, uh, pink to red, some uh, fossils of uh, hemorrhage, and uh, interestingly, also there are some yellow areas. At microscopy, the tumor was composed of uh, cells showing an uh, abundant clear cytopl cytoplasm and uh, uh, nuclei showed the typical salt and pepper chromatin. And um, there was uh, uh, not significant atypia and uh, uh, the, 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 the architecture of the tumor was the uh, trabecular type. Looking at the higher magnification, you can see that the clear cytoplasm shows a fine, a fine granular uh, features. And uh, as a consequence of the macroscopic appearance uh, showing yellow areas, we suspected a lipid component of the tumor, and for this reason, we realized a sudden black uh, staining showing a positive uh, uh, staining of, 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 of the tumor, demonstrating a lipid content in a tumor cell. The tumor was positive for neuroendocrine markers, including synaptophysin shown in, in, in this picture, and also other neuroendocrine markers, including uh, chromogranin A. Um, the uh, K67 proliferative index uh, was not high and uh, uh, this tumor was classified as the G1 tumor. <coughs> Looking at the morphology of, of this tumor, uh, we uh, thought to a very nice paper published some years ago uh, describing, uh, uh, we participated to this paper, uh, and uh, in this paper a, a series of uh, lipid-rich uh, clear cell tumors was described and uh, the, the lipid content of uh, these tumor cells was, demonst was demonstrated using electron microscopy as uh, you can see in the right picture of the slide. In, uh, in this slide, there is a summary of the history of a clear cell pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasm, first described in 1983 as a clear cell uh, panin, and in 1997, um, Ordonet described a, a lipid rich variant of a clear cell panet. Um, this means that not all clear cells uh, panets are composed of lipid-rich cells, sometimes uh, there are glycogen-rich uh, cells, and uh, lipid-rich uh, cells may represent a variant of uh, clear cell uh, panets. Clear cell uh, 
pancreatic neuromicrin neoplasma were uh, described as a, a, a specific tumor type associated uh, with the, the um, von Hippel-Lindau disease, but <clears throat> in, in the paper I showed you before, published in 2006, um, uh, we uh, observed that the lipid-rich uh, pancreatic neuronuclein uh, neoplasma can be also identified in patients without an association with von Hippel-Lindau disease. So we observed this uh, tumor type in uh, sporadic cases, but also in a few cases uh, or associated with MEN1. And uh, after six years, in 2012, a paper published in Endocrine Pathology uh, demonstrated that uh, lipid-rich pancreatic neuroclinic uh, neoplasma can also be observed in patients with MEN1 syndrome. In this very recent paper, <coughs> published by the group of Wolkenadzai, you can see that uh, um, the lipid-rich uh, subtype of pancreatic neuroclinic tumor uh, can be included in a subgroup of neoplasma associated with an aggressive behavior. In, the, in this paper, uh, the, the authors separated uh, different uh, pancreatic tumors, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, on the basis of uh, morphological appearance, and uh, we uh, were uh, then they were able to uh, separate. Uh, a different group of morphological subtype of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor uh, associated with different uh, prognosis. The most important uh, concern regarding clear cell and lipid-rich uh, clear cell pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors regards the differential diagnosis. The first of all, uh, the, 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 different, the main differential diagnosis, especially when we are working on a biopsy, is uh, uh, the different diagnosis with a metastasis, in particular with a metastasis from a renal cell carcinoma. Another possible different diagnosis includes uh, adrenocortical neoplasm, and uh, in uh, this setting, uh, uh, immunohistochemistry can be useful for the different diagnosis. The different diagnosis uh, uh, with uh, uh, kidney cancer may include uh, uh, an immunohistochemical panel with the use of Paxuit, the monoclonal one, and uh, the, the, the differential diagnosis with adrenocortical neoplasm may include steroidogenic factor one, uh, which is positive in, uh, in adrenocortical tumors, and cytokeratin that in general is negative in uh, adrenocortical tumors. Pay attention that inhibin in a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease can be positive, so it's not useful for the differential diagnosis with adrenocortical neoplasm. But in addition, we have also some different pancreatic neoplasm that can show a clear cell appearance. On the left, you can see a summary of uh, immunohistochemical profile of uh, lipid-rich uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. This tumor is positive for chromogranin, pancreatic hormones, and somatostatin receptor subtype 2A. But uh, also, um, solid pseudopapillary neoplasma can uh, show clear cell and uh, Immunohistochemistry is useful in this context because, in general, these tumors are not positive for chromogranin A, but they are positive for other markers, including CD99, as we, we um, discussed in the, in the presentation, uh, showing a dot-like paranuclear immunoreactivity. These tumors are generally positive, strongly positive for beta-catenin and are positive for vimentin. While there is an aberrant expression for ecadarine that can be negative or nuclear depending on the antibody used. And finally, it's worth noting that acinar cell carcinoma can sometimes present a clear cell component, and immunohistochemistry for trypsin, chymotrypsin, and BCL10 is very useful for the differential diagnosis. So, to summarize, uh, we, the differential diagnosis include non-pancreatic tumors like adrenocortical neoplasm and clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and the differential diagnosis include also 
other type of pancreatic neoplas like acinocell carcinoma and solid pseudopapillary neoplas that sometimes can uh, present a clear cell component. Now we uh, can move to the last uh, case. <coughs> This uh, is uh, the clinical history. Is a, a, a young boy uh, presented with uh, clinical symptoms of Cushing syndrome. And uh, <coughs> for this reason, a serum level of uh, ACTH was uh, evaluated and uh, uh, an increase of uh, corticos cortisol and ACTH uh, level was identified. Uh, the patient uh, did not show any pituitary lesion and uh, um, abdominal uh, mRNA uh, showed a large mass of uh, the pancreatic uh, body. So for this reason, uh, the patient underwent a surgery and after surgery, the symptoms of the Cushing syndrome disappeared. Unfortunately, five months Uh, after this, uh, this uh, surgery, the uh, patient presented an uh, elevated serum level of a fetoprotein and uh, at the radiology a recurrent tumor in the pancreatic tail was identified and for this reason the patient underwent uh, chemotherapy but unfortunately two years later he died. This is uh, the slide of the primary uh, tumor resected. You can see that it's a, a tumor showing a, a trabecular in some areas solid uh, growth. And uh, at higher magnification, you can uh, uh, nicely identify this uh, uh, trabecular uh, pattern resembling a, a neuroendocrine tumor. Don't forget that the patient presented a Cushing syndrome at the clinical level. At high magnification, uh, cells showed a, a eosinophilic cytoplasm. Not very uh, atypical nuclei were, were detected, but uh, sometimes uh, some well evident nuclei were identified. And um, This is a detail, and uh, interestingly, this tumor, uh, despite this uh, uh, neuroendrocking like uh, morphology resembling well differentiated neuroendrocking tumor, presents a very a high mitotic index, uh, both evaluated on uh, hematocenin staining uh, section and uh, also using phosphohistone free immunohistochemistry. And this tumor also presented an elevated K67 label index. So, to summarize the morphological uh, uh, picture, uh, we observed an encapsulated tumor. Uh, there was not a fibrous stroma inside the tumor. This tumor was highly cellular with a trabecular architecture. No uh, large area of necrosis uh, was identified. Cells were monomorph without a significant atypia. Uh, nuclear atypia, but uh, nuclei were evident in several cells. Mitotic activity and uh, also K67 level index was high. So, <coughs> the first uh, hypothesis was a, a CTH producing well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, we performed chromogranin synaptophysis immunohistochemistry, and uh, these uh, two neuroendocrine markers were negative. ACTH immunistic chemistry showed scattered cells positive, confirming the possibility of a ACTH producing tumor. Interestingly, this tumor was positive for a trypsin, <coughs> and the immune reactivity for trypsin associated with a negative immunostaining for neuroendocrine marker suggested the first possibility of a NCTH producing acinal cell carcinoma. To summarize the immunohistochemical profile, so tumor was PDX1 positive, confirming the pancreatic origin of the lesion. Acinal cell marker were positive, including trypsin and BCL10 immunoactivity. Uh, lipase and amylase were negative, but it's not surprising because uh, these uh, two markers are very low, low sensitive markers for acinal cell cancer, expressing in very minority of cases. 
Tumors was positive for both ACTH and beta endorphin. And this is not surprising because uh, these two peptides derived from the cleavage of proprio melanocortine, so they result as a, after the uh, prote protease of proprio melanocortine. And frequently, uh, these two peptides are positive in ACTH producing tumors. And finally, neuroendocrine markers were negative, including chromogranin A and synaptophysin that were performed when we observed the cases. The case. Other markers uh, were uh, negative, including cytokeratin-19, cytokeratin-20, galatin, alpha-fetoprotein, and receptor progesterone. Receptor progesterone. So our final diagnosis was an acinar cell carcinoma producing ACTH in a, uh, in a, a, a young boy, two years old. So now I would like to show you some, uh, an update of pancreatic acinal cell carcinoma observed in pediatric uh, population. Um, acinal cell carcinoma in a pediatric population represents about 7% of pancreatic neoplasma with an annual incidence of 0.003 for 100,000 people, and uh, is uh, more frequently observed in male and uh, the average age uh, uh, that identified uh, after review of the literature is uh, about nine here, with a range between uh, three and 16 years. Um, this uh, tumor in uh, several cases uh, present uh, uh, unspecific symptoms, including abdominal pain, uh, uh, nausea, fever, anemia, and uh, there, there are not cases in a pediatric uh, population associated with uh, symptoms uh, depending on lipase hypersecretion that can be observed in adults uh, with uh, uh, metastatic acinar cell carcinomas, and these symptoms include polyalthralgia, panniculitis, subcutaneous fat necrosis. But interestingly, uh, in, 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 in children, um, uh, acinar cell carcinoma is uh, associated with an uh, increased alpha-fetoprotein serum level, and in about 10% of acinar cell carcinomas in children, uh, there is an association with the Cushing syndrome. So when we have uh, a, 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 a tumor in a child uh, associated with Cushing syndrome, we, we uh, need to think uh, as a possible first uh, hypothesis, uh, diagnostic hypothesis, uh, unas, an acinar cell carcinoma of the pancreas and not d'emblée a pancreatic nerve endocrine tumor. Uh, we published uh, some years ago uh, uh, this article in American Journal of Surgical Pathology on ACTH secreting pancreatic neoplasma associated with Cushing disease, Cushing syndrome, sorry. And uh, you can see that in adults, most of the cases are observed in adults, while all cases associated in, uh, uh, observed in, in, ch in children are not pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, but are acinal cell carcinoma. So the, 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 the presence of Cushing syndrome in child's, in children um, uh, suggests, as a first diagnosis hypothesis, an acinal cell carcinoma if we have a pancreatic mass. Uh, these are aggressive uh, uh, cancer. You can see that uh, <coughs> uh, metastasis are observed in about 40% of cases. Local uh, lymph nodes uh, are observed in 26% of cases and distal metastasis in about 22%. And uh, <clears throat> the prognosis is not good. You can see the couple of mile curves which arrives uh, to zero after 72 months. And in the revision of the literature, uh, we observe that about uh, 20% 30% of patients died of disease, 14% uh, were alive with disease, and 45% uh, um, uh, were alive free of disease, but uh, after an average follow-up time of observation of uh, 25 months.
The differential diagnosis of uh, Asinal cell carcinoma, also in children, includes uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, pancreatoblastoma, and solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. Uh, the differential diagnosis with the uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor uh, uh, includes the, the use of an immunohistochemical panel uh, with the antibodies directed against, against um, acinal cell marker like uh, trypsin, chemotrypsin, and BCL10. Um, the differential diagnosis uh, with pancreatoblastoma is not based on uh, immunohistochemical profile because it's the same, but uh, on morphology, in fact, in pancreatoblastoma, we have uh, the presence of a squamoid nest. And, and the last uh, different diagnosis is uh, with uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. And uh, here, in this context, uh, uh, morphology associated with the specific immunohistochemical profile is very useful. Uh, I would like to remember uh, you that uh, um, in solid pseudopapillary neoplasma we have a specific uh, characteristic dot like uh, perinuclear immunoreactivity for CD99, and also in this tumor we have a strong uh, immunoreactivity uh, at the nuclear level of. Uh, 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 beta catenin, but uh, in 30% of asina cell carcinoma, we can observe this alteration. So, this was the last case, and uh, with this uh, image from my hometown in Amalfi Coast, we both uh, thank you for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. La Rosa and Dr. Osella, uh, for this uh, excellent talk on neuroendocrine neoplasms. From our viewers, so we have quite a few questions that I Thank could see. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. La Rosa and Dr. Online. Osella. I'm going to uh, read them for, for this, you in a minute. Uh, excellent talk on neuroendocrine neoplasms. Uh, the first question is uh, just one second. Is, there a, is it necessary to detect hormones in neuroendocrine tumor by immunohistochemistry? Okay, it is not really necessary. Uh, guidelines, international guidelines say that uh, key I67 and neuroendocrine markers are enough to make a diagnosis of an NET or an N. However, we find that uh, useful, uh, that is useful to, um, to employ antibodies against uh, hormones, at least uh, in the pancreas, um, in, in two settings. One is to identify the clinical pathological relation with uh, the clinical picture of the pa patients and to help the clinicians to um, understand uh, the patient disease. And the second is uh, in the metastatic setting when we have an unknown primary and then uh, um, together with trans transcription factors, site-specific trans transcription factors, hormones may be of a help in identifying an unknown primary. Right. Uh, thank you. The next question is, how to differentiate adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation from mean N? Okay. Thank you for the, this question, because this is a very interesting and critical point. Uh, we we uh, must uh, um, underline this um, the difference uh, between an adenocarcinoma or a non-neuroendocrine carcinoma, a morphological non-neuroendocrine carcinoma with the expression of neuroendocrine markers, from one side and a, neuro, a, neuro, a true neuroendocrine neoplasm from the other side. If you have a morphology that otherwise is typical for, for an adenocarcinoma or for, um, I don't know, a squamous cell carcinoma or other carcinomas, and uh, in, you, you may by chance um, immunohistochemistry for general neuroendocrine markers and you find them positive, you are not allowed uh, to make a diagnosis of an N or of a mean. You are allowed to make a, diagno a diagnosis of a mean only 
when you see in a metoxylin eosin a component of a new um, neuro with neuroendocrine morphology and a component with no non neuroendocrine morphology okay so um identifying on your hematoxylin eosin slide the neuroendocrine morphology distinct from the non neuroendocrine one is uh, the um, co um, the cornerstone for the diagnosis of menen so neuro general neuroendocrine markers in immunohistochemistry is not enough to make the diagnosis of an N or of a mean. Right. Uh, thank you again. So the next question is, uh, should ATRX be done in all the neuroendocrine tumors? So uh, in the pancreas, uh, with a well-differentiated morphology, I think that RTRX should be done together, if it's possible, with ducts, okay? Because uh, this gives uh, uh, not only uh, the confirmation, okay, uh, RTRX and ducts are uh, negative in 30, 40% of cases uh, in uh, pan nets. And this is, uh, um, support for the differential diagnosis between a net G3 and the neck. But in the context of a proven net, uh, the loss of ATRX is uh, an, an important uh, prognostic uh, factor. So I think it should be done. So you mean just to clarify that even if it is a low grade NET, you would uh, uh, advise that one should do ATRX? So if it is a if it is a net G two, I would advise this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So this is the next question that uh, between mitotic count and Ki sixty seven. So it seems that Ki sixty seven is more important. So is no. it necessary to both to do both when we know that uh, doing Ki sixty seven is enough in classifying the uh, uh, classifying yeah. the entities. It is very important to do both, not because ki 67 is more important, but uh, because the higher wins, okay? If uh, um, you have a ki 67 more than 3%, you have a net G2 also if the mitotic in index is less than two, okay? Right. So it is very important to perform ki 67 in every case. Right, right. Now I think like suppose, uh, uh, is there an instance when mitotic count happens to be more than the KI and then it uh, shifts the classification? Mm, no, <laughs> in most of the cases, yes. uh, CI 67 is uh, more important, but I think that both that should be done. There are some cases in which uh, apparently mitotic count is higher and in general, there is a problem of fixation and the immunostochemistry doesn't work very well. And you may have a K67 in immunostaining is not real. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. That's good to know. Uh, here is one question. So what's the treatment difference between uh, net grade three and non-neuroendocrine carcinoma? And the second question is on the same line that is there any treatment difference between small cell carcinoma versus large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, the first question, uh, I, before the second, no, there is no, uh, there is not really a difference between small cell and large cell. However, differentiating small cell and lar large cell nets is important for, for, from a perspective point of view. So we are trying to separate small cell from large cell because in the future, we think, we really think that uh, there will be some differences also in the management because small cells are very much like small cell lung cancer, okay? Whereas large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of each different site seems to have much uh, um, similar um, pathogenesis to the um, site-specific non-neuroendocrine carcinoma of that site. So it is important now to separate them and to study them separately. 
Okay. And the first question was between NADG3 and non neuroendocrine uh, neoplasms? No, NADG3 no. and neuroendocrine carcinoma. Okay. The, the, the differential diagnosis is first morphological. Okay. Because you should have, uh, by definition, to have a NAT, you should have a well differentiated uh, morphology, uh, a well differentiated neuroendocrine morphology. So you should have um, moderately abundant cytoplasms, uh, granular cytoplasms, eosinophilic cytoplasms, and nucle um, nuclei should not have very large and red nucleoli. Okay. Um, however, so um, NetG3 goes in the def differential diagnosis uh, with the neck when we are speaking about of a large cell neck, okay? And so the baseline is the morphology. When the morphology is not enough, you can add um, immunohistochemistry you, uh, for, um, um, for P P P53, RB, and uh, possibly in the pancreas for RTRX and so on, as I detailed in my in my in my lecture. This is much important because NetG3 may be treated with uh, may be better treated with uh, um, targeted um, therapies that are similar to that of uh, low grade NETs and do not uh, benefit from a platinum based chemotherapeutic okay this is the start point if you give uh, platinum and etoposide to an g3 patient you do not well to the patient the patient will go worse than if he had, if he had received no therapy okay so this is very important. The differential diagnosis is of paramount importance. Thank you. So here is one other question in the same line that is there a third category of neuroendocrine carcinoma when we are unable to differentiate uh, between small cell versus large cell? How are we supposed to categorize those tumors? We can do like this. If you see large cell, you call them large cell, okay, neuroendocrine carcinoma large cell type. If you don't see large cell, you call it small cell type. This is the intermediate type does not exist anymore. Right, okay, <laughs> right. So thank you. So uh, this is another question. Uh, I think this is a very practical problem that we see often. Uh, when we see a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor in the liver, of what are the most useful immunomarkers to determine the site of origin? And if we are unable to determine the site of origin and there is no radiologic clue, what is your uh, practical suggestion how we sign those cases? So uh, when you are in a metastatic site, first you should uh, separate neck from neck because if this is a neck, you don't need to find, you, you don't have the real need to find the primary, okay? Because this is a metastatic neck and this should go to chemotherapy, okay? If it is a net, you should give some information to the clinician because in some cases it is important to perform surgery on the primary also if this is metastatic. So, uh, in the liver, you, you asked me the liver. In the liver, most um, the two um, main possibilities are um, a small intestine, okay, or um, a lung. These are the two, or a pancreas, okay. So to discriminate in this uh, <laughs> among these possibilities. Morphology first, because if you have um, net, uh, um, an ileal net, you should uh, be able to recognize it also in the uh, biopsy, okay? But the biopsy, it, it may be artifactual, crashed and so on. So most important is to use uh, uh, transcription factors, at least CDX2, uh, TTF1, and CDX2 for uh, the, um, the ileal nets, uh, TTF1 for the lung, uh, 
this is not very sensitive, but it is very specific. And for the pancreas, you can you have a panel and should use a panel because this, there is not a, a very mm, there is not an absolutely sensitive market for the panels. Maybe I let one is the best, or you may use. But I think you may use you may use it uh, with other markers, PDX one if you have or Pax eight, but Pax eight is not very sensitive. Uh, very specifics. And you can add the hormones and you can add uh, all you have <laughs> to, to give uh, a clue. I can add, uh, for example, that hazel one also is positive, sometimes rectal uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So be careful uh, for uh, uh, when you use only one uh, transcription factor. Right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, Please opine on the use of BCL10 in the workup of carcinomas of unknown primary. How would you handle a metastatic neoplasm? Is BCL10 positive, trypsin negative in the absence of a definite pancreatic mass? Okay. So first of all, uh, is depend on the antibody you use because uh, the BCL10 specific for, for acinal cell carcinoma is the carboxy terminal part, uh, the antibodies recognizing the carboxy terminal part of the BCL10, because uh, this uh, part of the peptide overlap in sequences with the, a pancreatic lipase, a carboxy ester lipase or carboxy ester lipase. So, if you use an N terminal, an antibody recognizing the N, N terminal part, you are not thinking or you are not working for an acinal cell carcinoma. Um, BCL10 is very specific and sometimes uh, pancreatic and uh, pancreatic acinal cell carcinoma can be BCL10 positive and trypsin negative. But in the case, if you don't have a pancreatic mass, don't forget that there are some carcinomas with acinal cell differentiation in the stomach, for example, in the colon. And I also, uh, I, I have seen a, a acinal cell carcinoma uh, in, arising in a metastasis from a testicular teratoma showing an acinal, an acinal uh, tissue. So don't forget that we, if you don't have a pancreatic mass, you can have gastric or colonic Asin, carcinoma with acinal cell differentiation. And BCL10 can be positive. Right. I think there is one similar question on the same line that uh, is one marker enough for defining SNR differentiation? So if you have a morphology suggesting acinal cell carcinoma and uh, you uh, have a, a positivity for BCL10 or for trypsin or chimotrypsin, you can uh, uh, sign out a diagnosis of acinal cell carcinomas because uh, sometimes you can have an acinal cell carcinoma positive for BCL10 and negative for trypsin and vice versa. And but if you use, my suggestion is to use both, at least both marker, BCL10 with trypsin or BCL10 with chemotrypsin and using both, you can detect 100% of cases. Right. So the next question is about actually a neuroendocrine tumors of the stomach. I think this is a very interesting question which we often face. So is there any cutoff point for neuroendocrine hyperplasia versus neuroendocrine tumor in gastric or intestinal mucosa if there are no visible lesions on endoscopy? Okay. Whether it's a net or just hyperplasia, that is uh, always a frequent question in multidisciplinary meetings. Thank you. Okay. Rather than net a hyperplasia, I think net and dysplasia, ACL cell dysplasia. And there is a cutoff the, basing on the sites of the nodule because we can have a different type of dysplasia. And the, the more difficult is a larger nodules and 0, 0.0 millimeter is the cutoff to, to the 0 5, 0.5. 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.5 for the cutoff distinguishing between uh, ACL cell dysplasia, we are thinking about ACL cell tumor huh? in the stomach and uh, an ACL cell uh, tumor. Right, but that cutoff is not there in the WHO, if I remember. Uh, 
Yes, but uh, uh, there is not a, a specific chapter on uh, dysplasia and hyperplasia in the WHO. <laughs> they have delayed the, the, pre, the precursor lesions in the WHO of digestive tumors, so they, they, they do not exist, but we saw that, we see them. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, another question from one of our viewers, that is there a morphologic clue that differentiates uh, a grade three from uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma without molecular tests? Yes, as I told before, and uh, morphology first. Uh, we are pathologists. We should look at the images. Molecular biology is important. It's, uh, it, it is getting more and more important. But morphology first, you have really um, the um, many many morphological clues to the fact that you have uh, you are facing with an SG3 or a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, before I have cited the nuclei, nuclei, nucleoli, cytoplasm, but you can look also at the um, architecture of the proliferation. If you have a more organized proliferation without necrosis or with spot necrosis, uh, with only focal necrosis. Um, if you have, um, I, I give many much value to the nucleoli. Nucle red nucleoli should not be seen in um, in an SG3. Red nucle cherry nucleoli should be only seen in a large cell uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma. However, molecular biology is not uh, um, really needed. You should use um, simply immunohistochemistry. But I think that at least P53 and RB immunohistochemistry are important. Um, possibly um, uh, RB more than P53 because there, because there is some evidence that P53 mutated NetG3 do exist. So uh, it is rare, but um, P53 may be overexpressed also in NetG3 in rare cases. However, if you have the loss of RB, you are facing with a large cell uh, uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma and not with a G3 neuroendocrine tumor. Right. Uh, like I think this is a practical question uh, because uh, we have viewers from different parts of the world where uh, we may not have access to many immunostaining markers. And if we are having a biopsy and the differential diagnosis is between, uh, for example, grade three NET versus Larcel and say KI67 is 50% or say 34 or 40%. So what is the suggestion? What do you do? Oh, okay, uh, I am not cited KI67 because as I said, there is not a definite cutoff. It, however, if you have a neuroendocrine morphology and a 35 or 40 percent KI67, it is most mostly conceivable that it is an SG3 and not a large cell neck. Okay, and you have also uh, the clinical picture, however. Okay, because the clinical picture, you, you you should also speak with your clinicians or with the person that is seeing the patient. Because uh, mm, neuroendocrine carcinoma is an aggressive neoplasm, is uh, mm, the, the patient is sick, is not very well, yeah. and also if you have access to uh, serum markers, chromogranin A is not so. Um, Le uh, chromogranin A levels are uh, higher in neuroendocrine tumors than in neuroendocrine carcinomas. If you have access to um, uh, nuclear medicine imaging, uh, you have a PET, uh, PET with FDG is more typical for um, neuroendocrine carcinomas, whereas uh, uh, somatostatin analogs um, imaging is uh, mostly uh, positive in neuroendocrine tumors and so on. You, uh, It is a puzzle you have to <laughs> put on uh, this, every piece. These cases are generally discussed in multidisciplinary team. 
But if you only have two or three slides and you have to choose, I think that RB1, if you have P53 and eventually somatostatin receptor immunohistochemistry can be useful. Yes, but somatostatin receptors in my hands are positive also in large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So I, I would go uh, with, the, with the morphology with P53 RB. KI67, if you have 80% of KI67, you should not have doubt, <laughs> okay? Uh, the problem is when KI67 is 60%, for example, okay? Because 60% uh, may be a large cell or an FG3 anyway. You right. should, uh, I think that multidisciplinary dis discussion is very useful uh, in the critical cases. Right. Thank you. These are very important suggestions. And uh, one question from one of our viewers is how reliable is KI67 in cytology or FNA specimens? So this is the, the, high, the big question. <laughs> we have uh, some uh, consideration to do. First of all, that we can have uh, heterogeneous expression of KI67. So the problem is, uh, is it, really important to make a different diagnosis in cytology between a G1 or G2. And uh, so I think that the most important different diagnosis and the cytological step is, is a well-differentiated tumor versus a poorly differentiated neuronicline carcinoma. Then if you have a, a key 67 cytology of 1.5, 2.5, 3.5 is not a big problem. So I think that uh, key 67 can be give you an additional information, but it is not the only marker you need to consider for the differential the diagnosis. I think that um, at the cytological step, the first most important is to differentiate it with morphology between a well-differentiated and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Right, thank you. Uh, the next question is about uh, PDX1. How often do you use PDX1? Not, not very frequently, but uh, I think that now uh, we, we have this antibody. Uh, we don't use it uh, routinely, Maybe but uh, sometimes for uh, the detection of metastasis of unknown primary sometimes can be useful. As I said before, this can be useful in, the, in a panel of other transcription factors in a metastatic context. Right. Uh, so this is a follow-up question from one of our viewers regarding, I think, a neuroendocrine dysplasia in the uh, in the luminal tract. So uh, in case of dysplasia, how should the uh, how should they proceed if there is no targetable lesion to remove, but a clear precursor histological lesion? What do you recommend? So there are not the guidelines how to follow these patients. <laughs> First of all, in most of cases, these patients are patients with autoimmune chronic atrophic gastritis. So the ECL cell dysplasia of the stomach in general is associated with this disease. Uh, if you don't have a microscopical uh, uh, evident lesion at endoscopy, you cannot remove. So the follow-up is, uh, is recommended, but there are not guidelines how to do this follow-up. We perform a nice study. We have not published yet. I don't know if we had to write it, <laughs> but uh, uh, consider different hospitals and sometimes different uh, uh, medical doctors in the same hospital. We, you, we found that there are a different type of follow-up of these patients. So I think that the follow-up also considering that the next step after, after a ACL cell dysplasia in the stomach is a net uh, a gastric type 1 neuroendocrine tumor, uh, in, which in general is an indolent tumor. So we don't, you don't need to move uh, versus uh, an aggressive uh, therapeutic approach. So right. follow up. Right. Yeah, so... Uh... Here is one more question. I think that might be the last question, uh, Dr. La Rosa and Dr. Sila. Uh, the question is, do you think both neuroendocrine and the non-neuroendocrine component in pancreatic minens derive from the same progenitor cell? And if you think so, how can we prove the common ancestor? 
Are there any mutational signatures that we can separately demonstrate in both components for this purpose? So, uh, in meaning the two components in, are uh, clonally related. In general, you have uh, the same background in the two components. There are several papers published for in this topic. And uh, when you have an high-grade neuron brain carcinoma component, uh, you have uh, some additional alteration in the neck component versus the adenocarcinoma component, for example. But uh, that are superimposed in a, a, a common, a common uh, molecular background. And uh, the only way to prove the common ancestor is to separately um, study uh, the two components. So it is very important to be, um, um, to be consistent with this diagnosis to separate the two components. However, um, as Stefano said, there are uh, all the studies that are, have been published are in the line that uh, uh, there is a divergent differentiation with a common ancestor. And uh, most of the cases, uh, at least both, maybe in the pancreas, uh, we have many cases um, with uh, well differentiated, not many, but more cases with well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor and uh, uh, carcinoma, so ductal or acinal cell carcinoma. But uh, for example, in the colon, uh, most of the cases are adenocarcinoma and neuroendocrine carcinoma, so uh, poorly differentiated NAN. And uh, you have you 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 are able to um, um, to evidentiate in both components the same uh, um, alterations in line or with the APC and beta catenin, beta catenin uh, mutations or uh, with an MMR uh, so mismatch repair deficiency and and so on in both components. Right, right. Thank you. I think oh, I just saw one more question uh, related to mean and uh, I think that must be the last one that uh, uh, the WHO criteria says that uh, to, to diagnose mean and so there should be 30% of bone component. But the practical problem is we get a biopsy and uh, uh, from a mucosal site and we see two components which are of course by criteria we can differentiate that these are two components and immune stain helps and what do we do and uh, actually i also had this experience a couple of times because the moment we say that it is a mixed neuroendocrine non-neuroendocrine carcinoma because of the neuroendocrine component they don't do the resections they are going to give chemotherapy so we are not going to see the resection specimen to use the 30 percent criteria and actually properly uh, classify them and and have some data what's your suggestion on this biopsy specimens so we thank you very much for this uh, question because this is again this is a crucial question uh, Personally, we both do not totally agree with the 30% cutoff uh, for the definition of meaning, as uh, the, prob the problem is, is uh, practical. As you said, if it, if it is, um, if there is uh, also only as a minor component of neck, anyway, the patient go to chemotherapy, okay? So right. it is important to mention this in the, in the pathology report. Also, if this is a, a, a I mean, minor component of also if this is a five or 10% of the tumor mass. Uh, if we retain the 30% cutoff, we can only make a diagnosis of mean in the surgical sample. But uh, as you said, most of cases are seen on uh, biopsies. So uh, the 30% cutoff was an arbitrary cut off that was conceived um, 10 years ago, more, more than, than 10, 10 years, years ago. ago, because it was uh, in the 2010 the WHO, when the concept of, um, there was a manic, uh, however, when the concept of mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine, neuroplasma was to be defined, when uh, we did, did not know um, the um, more um, well uh, the pathogenesis and the morphology of uh, these tumors. Now we have uh, decided not we have decided we have seen that minions are um, 
mixed neoplasms when, when, where you can see different morphologies. So if we define uh, meanings on the morphological basis, we can affordably make a diagnosis of meaning also if we see uh, less than 30% component of neuron doctrine or non neuron doctrine. The, the important thing is to um, keep in mind that meaning is, as uh, Gunther Klopper said, meaning is a conceptual, um, a conceptual term. It is not a diagnosis. Meaning is not a diagnosis. You say there is a meaning, and then, then you have to report each component and um, to type it. and describe and grade and say and, and so on. So uh, thank you. This is a very important answer, at least uh, practically, uh, because I work in a cancer center where we have seen this uh, several times. And uh, what was the suggestion is that on the biopsy specimen, so you cannot top line it as meaning. You say that there is a mixed component, and in the comment, you say that this can be meaning. I mean, and that's the differential, and then talk to your oncologist. But the moment you go to the tumor board, and they are going to treat it as neuroendocrine carcinoma anyway. And there is no way for a pathologist to prove it later that what's the exact diagnosis. Yeah. This is frustrating, I'm, I agree. <laughs> specimen where uh, the biopsy was done with mixed tumor and there is a follow-up resection specimen, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But if, if they treat uh, they treat with new, new adjuvant chemotherapy and then they um, perform the surgical resection, there, there is the case that you don't see any more the neuroendocrine component. Right. So there is a problem. Yes. Right. No, thank you. And actually, uh, a bit, just a recent example we had that the patient had metastasis to the bone and there were several biopsies from the bone marrow and the uh, bone biopsies, which showed uh, neuroendocrine tumor alone. And then we kept asking them to look for the primary. And then finally, after one month or so, they found a lesion in the uh, Z junction, which showed mixed component and, and the biopsy. So the, actually, this is probably explains that maybe when it metastasizes, actually, it is the neuroendocrine component, which actually is more aggressive. And they are justified to treat the patient as neuroendocrine carcinoma when they get a biopsy specimen, I mean, prospectively, yeah. right? And, the, and the, it's worth noting that we perform a study and the, when you have a mean and uh, also examining uh, local lymph nodes, we found that in the same cases, lymph node with both component in the metastasis, other lymph node in the same specimen with only the exocrine component and the lymph node with only the neuroendocrine component. So mm -hmm. the history is very complex. <laughs> yes, and um, I think that uh, also the clinicians should be aware, uh, well aware, they should be explained by us that uh, both the components are relevant because it is true that the neck component is the most aggressive and the first to metastasize, but if you do proper chemotherapy, okay, platinum based, etoposide, and etc., you then uh, must face also the non neuroendocrine one. I have a case, we have published a case, uh, it was not uh, digestive, but it was in the um, in the urinary bladder, we had a mean, and it was treated with neuroadjuvant therapy. The neuroendocrine component disappeared, and then the patient experienced a progression of the non neuroendocrine component, which metastasized everywhere. Yes. So, both components are to be treated. We also have cases of adenocarcinoma associated with the net, not the neck and the lymph node metastases were only from the neuroendocrine well-differentiated component and not from the adenocarcinoma. So, right. So thank you, thanks for all your experience and suggesting your uh, wisdom on so many different types of neuroendocrine tumors, which are always challenging for the practicing pathologists all over the world. And uh, I think with that, we have come to the end of the QA session for, for your talks. And thank you so much, Dr. Uh, La Rosa and Dr. Usila for this excellent discussion. And you will be very happy to know that we had uh, uh, over 250 viewers, I think from so many different parts of the world. And I think I could keep count of viewers from at least uh, 25 different countries. We had uh, uh, 
viewers as far as from Somalia, Kosovo, Romania. I saw a small city in Romania, which I, I cannot pronounce, I think, properly, uh, uh, which I haven't heard before. I had to go to Wikipedia and check that it's in Romania. So Greece, Philippines, uh, I think uh, people joined from Bangladesh, Turkey, Lebanon, Poland, Ecuador, Nepal, Peru, Egypt, uh, Cambodia, Colombia, Dominican Republic, uh, from all over the world, basically. And thanks for you for uh, this educative session to all of our viewers. So we all appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. And for the viewers, uh, you get our next uh, session will be tomorrow. And thanks to Pancreatobiliary Pathology Society for having this for all of us. And so tomorrow we will meet again at 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And you can, uh, so our lectures will, first lecture will be from Dr. Adsey. So who is going to talk on uh, bile duct and gallbladder pathology. And then there will be talks from Dr. Michelle Reed and then Dr. Laura Wood will follow up. And we will have four lectures tomorrow. So hope to see you all again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.